Good evening, and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jenna Flanagan. Nearly a year into Donald Trump's presidency, and according to a new Pew report, already 60% of Americans say his election has led to worse race relations in the U.S. What's more is 65% of Americans also believe that there are very strong or strong conflicts between blacks and whites. While there is no denying that the president's first year got off to a rough start, could he be driving our nation in reverse? From sharp remarks directed at NFL players protesting racism to placing blame on both sides after the Charlottesville rally, the president's response to racial issues has left our country in turmoil. Now, as Trump approaches the first anniversary of his inauguration, Americans are examining what has he done regarding an issue many consider one of the country's most pressing. So joining me now to discuss race relations is Stony Brook sociologist and author of Resurrecting Slavery, Racial Legacies and White Supremacy in France, Dr. Crystal Fleming, Conservative Color Coalition Chair, Joseph Pinion, and journalist and Eisner Fellow, Tenzina Vega. Welcome everyone to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so first I want to start at the local level because we just have a new city council speaker who is um, a white male and that caused a lot of concern for a lot of groups within the city. So first, I just want to get your take on the fact that we now have three white men in incredibly powerful positions in the city of New York. I wonder, I mean, I think that says a lot about the pipelines. And I know we talk about this a lot when we talk about diversity in, in any industry, right? But mm -hmm. they're obviously um, not taking anything away from the current, you know, the people who are in these positions right now. But what does that say about a city like New York that is one of the most diverse, if not the borough of Queens, is the most diverse place in this in this country, mm -hmm. essentially? And we, our government doesn't seem to start to, to reflect that at the highest level. So I think we need to look at pipeline issues. We need to look at who's being uh, trained and or supported to get into these bigger roles. Um, because, yeah, this is a city that obviously um, does not, it, it's, it's, its government is not reflective necessarily of its uh, constituents. I mean, regarding the pipeline, my understanding is that the majority of the candidates were people of color. I mean, and so, and then the, the, the field winnowed to you know, the two leading can candidates mm -hmm. uh, who were white men. So I think uh, what we've seen, and especially in the wake of, of this election, or the selection, um, has been, uh, you know, a number of prominent Democrats, New York Democrats, have said, well, you know, the black Democrats, the party doesn't support us. Uh, there's a lot of resentment. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that that's anything new. And so one of the questions I have is, you know, why, if year after year, we have black Democrat uh, officials in New York saying the party doesn't really support black people, why do you keep supporting the Democrat Party? I mean, I am not saying support the other major party, which also doesn't support black people or people of color or the poor. Uh, but I'm saying that, you know, at a certain point, it starts to sound like an abusive relationship. You know, Absolutely. we complained about the Democrats. They don't support black people. But you keep, you know, affiliated with the party. I think that's a problem. And change for communities of color seems to come in fits and starts, mm -hmm. right? It's like we have one, you know, person at the helm who happens to be of color or a woman or both. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of retract. And that, of course, would be a reference right. to the previous speaker. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you really sit down and look at it, I think that first and foremost, I think that something good did happen. I think when you start talking about the fact that you do have someone who is openly, openly gay, you have someone who is openly HIV positive, living their truth, I think that is a positive thing. And I think that we should be able to celebrate that unrepentantly. I think that, you know, to, to be able to sit here and say that, you know, somehow this is a bad thing, I think, uh, similar to the people who might have said that it was a bad thing that we got an African-American president before we had a white president. I think that we should be able to, in some instance, celebrate the fact that something historic has happened, and that something actually moving us forward as society. Having said that, you know, I think it is an opportunity to pause and recognize that this is a state to, to this day has not elected a governor of color. This is a state that to this day, I mean, New York City has only had one black mayor and we ran him out after one term. So I think politics aside, I think it's an opportunity for us to take a step back, to pause and say that if there is to be some type of ethnic litmus test for what leadership is going to have, or if that is something that people of color are passionate about, mm -hmm. um, then there has to be a, a, a concerted effort for us to come together as a people to coalesce you know, around one candidate. Five of the seven candidates were candidates of color. I there think was that if, talk of you know, splitting the vote, you know, I of think course. that if they have been able to agree on one or two candidates to put forward earlier in the process, mm -hmm. there would have been an opportunity for you to be able to solidify support. So I think that 
you know, yes, something good has happened and we, sh again, should celebrate that. But also, I think it's an opportunity for us as a community, people of color, to sit back and say, if this is something that you are truly passionate about, mm -hmm. then you have to actually work together to have that happen. It can't be a crabs in the barrel situation. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, responsibility or onus on communities of color to sort of explain the difference between something that we find concerning as opposed to something that we find problematic? Like that there was a lot of concern over the fact that we now have three white men who are leading such mm -hmm. a diverse city. Mm -hmm. Not that we don't think that Corey Johnson can do the job, mm -hmm. but that there's concern. Is the responsibility on communities of color to make that the difference clear, or does there need to be just more understanding in a broader sense? I think more responsibility needs to be placed on white men and white people of New York mm -hmm. to admit that you know having diversity in our leadership is important. And I just want to push back a little. Um, you know, I am a, a both black and someone who is a member of the LGBT community, I'm bisexual. And so I also think it is important to recognize that yes, we have the first openly gay um, and HIV positive um, um, uh, council speaker. At the same time, uh, there are queer people of color. There are queer black New Yorkers. Um, and I don't think that on the one hand you could say, you know, we shouldn't be simplistic and just, you know, complain about, you know, the fact that three fourths uh, of, of the citywide, you know, leadership are white men. And then the other had said we should celebrate the fact that he's gay. I mean, you have to pick a side. Either the demographic matters or it doesn't. I think that we can have nuance in our conversation. We can have some intersectionality, you know, in our awareness and say we can recognize, yes, uh, that this is a problematic situation. We can admit that. Uh, it is important to have multiple axes of diversity, but also be very clear, you know, white supremacy would predict that even in a majority minority city, you're going to have white and male leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that is not new. I think we need to be more honest about that. It's not just an issue in the Democrat Party. It's an issue in the Republican Party. Uh, it's an issue throughout our nation. And I think we need to be clear that we never stopped being a nation that's systemically racist. And I think uh, you know, on all days, you know, when we're thinking about Martin Luther King, um, I think this is a moment to take a step back and realize, you know, we never got to that mountaintop, mm -hmm. um, no matter what you thought about uh, the election of the first black president. And so I think, you know, if there is yet again another white male uh, in our leadership position, I think we should be unapologetic and say that that's uh, a problem. And it's a problem that white New Yorkers need to do something about it. It shouldn't just be people of color saying, hey, raising the alarm. And that's a problem because the onus uh, to explain diversity, to advocate for diversity is often on people of color mm -hmm. or women of color or women or whoever the, the marginalized group tends to be. It's often has to come from us. And I think we're at a point, particularly with race in America, where we can't keep having the same conversation. This conversation has to evolve. And there are certain basic historical facts that happened in our country that we have to all agree are <laughs> we're essentially this is where we are and this is where we need to move forward. We can't continue to expect people of color to be the ones who are pushing for change, uh, whether you call that white allyship or, or you know, white people, uh, uh, you know, becoming more aware, regardless of what it is, it's not going to change if it's just coming from us. Well, I, I mean, I think it, it can't come from people of color alone. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the impetus for change always has to start with people of color. I think it starts with and ends with people of color. I think that when you look at the population of the city council, there are enough people of color on that council mm -hmm. where if they believe truly that this was something that was a non-starter a non for them, that they have the ability to withhold votes. When you start talking about things as far as a budget, they start talking about things as far as officiating and governing the city to say that we care about this enough that we are willing to start acting in a different capacity. So, you know, I, I do understand your point about us having a nuanced conversation. I think that it's important for us to understand that, again, all progress happens when we have the help of other people, when people of mm -hmm. conscience stand up um, and stand side by side. As when you start talking about Dr. King Day, you start talking about Goodman and Scorner, individuals who died um, side by side, you know, with individuals uh, in the Freedom Summer and things of that nature. So, you know, we need to have people who are not of color to recognize that we need to have diversity in our leadership. But also, it's incumbent on us to remind ourselves that, again, nothing happens if you don't demand it. Well, speaking of uh, change that is demanded, and I want to pivot a little bit to pop culture, there was recently an ad that was put out on a popular clothing website, H&M. A little boy was pictured, we've all seen the picture, in uh, a green hoodie with what a uh, slogan that a lot of people consider to be incredibly racist, stereotypical, and harkens back to a very dark period in America.
However, we've recently found out that this little boy's mother, who lives in Sweden, where this company is based, doesn't see the problem. So this brings up an issue that I seem to see coming up in race over and over again, which is like, well, I know a black person and they're not bothered by this, so right. why are you so upset? Right. Yeah, I mean, this, I, personally, I, I'm, un, you know, I'm not actually concerned with what the mother feels or doesn't feel. I think that, again, the litmus test for what is offensive is not if I can certainly find one individual of that group who is unoffended, mm -hmm. therefore now we no longer have an issue. Mm -hmm. So if the overwhelming majority of people from a particular group of people, I don't care if you're talking about black people, Jewish people, women, even white people, it doesn't really matter. If an overwhelming majority of people from a particular group, sect, feel offended, then something has probably happened in a way that whether it was intended or not is inappropriate. And so. Yes, it, it, I think we can add that to the conversation, the fact that maybe we should start talking about this not in a racial context, but a cultural context, as far as that we do have sensitivities in America that possibly do not exist in places like Sweden, right? That is just a cultural reality. Mm -hmm. But the fact is they're advertising these products in America, and America uh, does represent a sizable portion of their market base. So if you're going to do those things, then you have to have some level of, of sensitivity. And if not, then again, back to not to beat a dead horse, but then we as a community have an opportunity to say that if you're not going to treat us with respect, then you don't have an ability to actually have our dollars come through your doors. I would also like to see more emphasis put on, less emphasis put on trying to explain why something isn't racist, mm -hmm. which I think that the media in particular spends a lot of time trying to do, prove that something isn't offensive or isn't mm -hmm. racist, as opposed to calling it out when it is, right? And there seems to be this real reluctance to do that, I think, generally speaking. And to your point, what the mother said is what the mother said. I think, you know, the bigger issue here is we have a lack of understanding generally about how racism is systemic. It's not just individual, it's systemic. So what this ad shows us is something, to your point, that was offensive to African Americans and black Americans across the board for the most part. And we saw artists coming out and actually recreating that image, you know, to show this young black boy as a king, you know, or in many, many, uh, a much more favorable light. So I thought that was something interesting that came out of it. But we have a real problem with saying this is racist and we spend more time saying this isn't racist. And I think we really need to examine why we're doing that. I just want to jump in as someone who studied racism in Europe and, and looked at activists who are also fighting against anti-blackness and racism in Europe. Certainly there are people like the mother who will say, I don't see a problem. But I do want to point out, even in Sweden, um, you know, in the Netherlands, in France, where I've done research, there are folks who are very clear that white supremacy and racism exists, anti-blackness exists. Uh, Europe played a huge role in spreading the globalization of, of, of racism, modern racism. Um, and so I think uh, regardless of the mother's reaction, we have to acknowledge that there are also people of color and white allies in Europe who are fighting against racism as well. Yeah, I mean, it's also a, a matter of leadership. I mean, to the point we're talking about the city council, but also when you don't have diverse voices in that room yeah. to be able to sit there and look mm -hmm. at the final cut of that mm -hmm. ad and say, what are we doing here? Right. Uh, have you actually thought to possibly do a focus group? You know, you, this is the problem when you have, you know, retailers that are outsourcing you know, their core campaigns are spending millions of dollars to have third parties come up with ad campaigns and the final cut comes back in and you have a room that is not diverse saying, okay, that's good, we've spent the money on it, it's, it's clean, it's crisp, not understanding that there might be some deeper connotations there. So again, this ultimately comes back to the fact that we don't have diverse leaders in positions to say, this is not something that we should be doing as a corporation. Well, of course, speaking of diverse leaders, I do want to take it back to uh, our country and, of course, our leader at the moment, President Trump. Um, so there's been numerous instances. I mentioned Charlottesville in the intro. There's been other uh, criticisms, the way he's handled his reaction to the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Um, numerous, the way he's called out uh, NFL players who say that they're protesting racism and that's why they're taking a knee. Several instances, too many to name. Mm -hmm. um, is there, would more diversity in the cabinet, in the White House, fix this problem? Does it matter how the diversity is done? Who are the people of color who are there? I think the, one of the, and, and this is sort of connecting both of your, your last point and what, and what you're asking us right now, is that the onus, again, is often put on that one person of color to fix it. 
right? So in the case of H and M or in the case of journalism, you know, in which we're, we're, uh, we work, um, often people of color are brought in just to be that gut check, right? Just to be the person that says, "Can you make sure that this is okay?" We uh, people of color are not saviors. Um, they cannot save the Republican Party. They cannot save H and M. You know, if you just say, "Let me bring in, you know, my my one employee of color to make sure that this," is okay. I've been in that situation. I've had to do the back reads and you know to make sure something isn't offensive. Um, and at the same time, what we need to do is make sure we just create this leadership, you know, put that person in a position of power. Now, is the Republican Party beyond um, being saved? I don't think it's, it's necessarily some, the job of a, of a person of color to save the Republican Party. And, and, and to be fair, the, part, the, the administration did have a handful of people of color in mm -hmm. its administration. But those policies, when you look at the policies and who they're going to be impacting, regardless of whether they're people of color or not, these policies that are coming out of this administration are having an adverse and disparate impact on communities of color. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have to draw a line and a distinction between presence, as to your point, and power, mm -hmm. right? And, and also, you know, we have seen what happens when we have a black president, right? You can have the election of a black president who doesn't support black protests. You can have the election of a black president who honors the Confederacy every day, every year of his presidency, like presidents before him. That's what Obama did. Um, and so I think part of what we need to also have in our conversation um, is a level of sophistication about what are the politics, the racial politics of the folks of color, as well as white folks, in whatever position of leadership that they have, mm -hmm. right? Because we know uh, that, you know, as an old saying, all skin folk aren't kin folk. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that's about politics, right? Mm -hmm. It means that just because you look uh, like me or we share a, a similar demographic doesn't mean that we actually have collective, um, uh, well, we may have interests in common, but we may not be, uh, share politics about actually pursuing those interests. And so I think, uh, you know, we need to be clear that it's not just the color of someone or it's not just the gender of someone, even though diversity of demographics is important, we have to think about what do they support? Mm -hmm. What are the politics and policies that they support? And we can't just be satisfied that there's a person of color in the room. Also, I want to point out something else, because it's absolutely true that there's unfair labor placed on people of color in white dominated organizations to sort of bring the diversity solution. There's another thing that um, social psychological research has shown, and that is that when there is a person of color around, also regardless of whether they're be being given the labor of doing the diversity work, it's also an excuse for white people and organizations to think that whatever they're doing is probably fine because there is so-and-so, this black person or Asian American or whoever in the room. And so it also feeds into what I think you were saying earlier, sort of this culture of not wanting to talk about or acknowledge racism, right? And, and right where we work, right where we live and, and sort of treating it as something that affects other people uh, or is, a, is something that other people do, right? As opposed to something that structurally and systematically affects uh, our work context, our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. our educational system, our prison system uh, and policies through, throughout uh, every sphere of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you, I mean, to your point again, I, we have this, I think my misguided conversation around race often and not understanding that when you talk to people, the average American might not understand that you don't necessarily have to be racist to be a party to racism, right? Or that you necessarily have to be homophobic to be a party to homophobia, right? And so this, we have these, these instances where people don't recognize the fact that, you no, know, if, if you're not throwing stones at a gay person like Matthew Shepard, then you're not, you're, you're not, you're not actually bashing gay people. Mm -hmm. Or if you're not actually hurling racial epithets at people, then you're not actually racist. Not understanding that somehow, look, the reality is, unfortunately, with this administration, the issues that pertain to communities of color have not been prioritized. That's when, unfortunately, if you look at somebody like Amarosa, who recently left, left the administration, those are individuals who, she's an individual who was literally across the street because the needs of the communities of color are literally out of sight and out of mind when it comes to this administration. That is just the unavoidable reality. So again, I think that it's, it, we, we make it more difficult to have the pertinent conversation that we need to have on race because when we start labeling things as just inherently racist, you know, I think racism is intrinsic in America in general. But I mm -hmm. think when we can talk about the fact that just because you don't actually harbor racial animus towards someone doesn't mean that the manner in which you are conducting yourself and the manner in which we are conducting our government, our governing can actually have a, a disparate impact on communities of color. Well, that's an excellent point and uh, actually leads specifically why I wanted to have a sociologist here. And that is because, so we've seen over time, we've had the Civil Rights Act, we've seen um, Title IX, the laws change. However, 
people still tend to think and act in something of a a clannish tribal nature. And I'm wondering how much of that is just inherent to the human psyche mm -hmm. to be able to see someone else who doesn't mm -hmm. look like me, mm -hmm. but still deserves the same things that my family, my children deserve, mm -hmm. as opposed to I need to make sure that my family is mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. and you come next because you're different. I mean, it's certainly true that, I mean, the history of human oppression, you know, we, we have the history of modern racism, which stretches back several centuries. The history of oppression uh, stretches back thousands of years. And so there's nothing new about groups trying to hoard power, right, mm -hmm. or trying to protect their, uh, their own resources. But I think we need to be very specific about the form uh, of, of the power structure in our country, right? And it was founded on, among other things, white supremacy, racial capitalism, racist capitalism more specifically. And so I think that, sure, uh, the idea that there could be some kind of kumbaya, you know, everyone holds hands and we don't, you know, try to protect our own, I think that uh, has probably never existed in human history. But does that mean that we are condemned to always reproduce a white supremacist society? No, I don't think that's the case. I think what we've seen throughout history, and even recent history, is that when you do have change, right, it doesn't happen by happenstance, to some, some of your earlier points. It happens because people organize. It happens because power structures are challenged and transformed and disrupted. And so I think that, you know, hearts and minds don't change by mistake. Um, we are socialized in particular ways mm -hmm. that shape how we see the world. Uh, news media contribute to the stereotypes that we have about which groups are worthy and which groups are not, which groups are typically criminalized and which groups are not. Uh, and those are things that can change, right? We now do have certain civil rights on paper, um, even if they're not uh, always enforced. Uh, but we have an opportunity, anti-racist regardless of the background, to look wherever we are in our uh, work lives and our neighborhoods and say, what is the history and the ongoing practice of systemic racism right where I am, um, instead of denying and acting as though it doesn't exist? And what can I do to not just say I don't have racial animus against someone, but to actually actively be anti-racist? Is that the most important thing for people moving forward, is to at least understand what the systemic problems are? I think it's part of that. I think it's also a question of understanding the narratives, right? Mm -hmm. So around the election, of course, we all saw the white working class was a narrative, right, that emerged around the presidential election. These were white people who were unemployed, who were dying of opioid and other drug addictions. Um, and there was an empathy that surrounded that narrative, particularly even in research um, that was coming out, you know, from Brookings and other places, mm -hmm. that sort of positioning this group who rightfully needed that empathy, right? I would never suggest that someone who's... who's but there's a, also a black and brown But there's class. also, and I wrote a couple of pieces about what about the black working class specifically was the headline, you know, what? where is the empathy for black poverty and pain? I mean, mm -hmm. these were the questions that I was asking, not to take away from white poverty and pain, but we never seem to have that same narrative for black and brown Americans who are equally struggling, if not more so. And so when you look at the numbers, if we start putting a structural framework around this and mm -hmm. looking at things like wealth, white Americans have 10 to 13 times more wealth right. than black and brown Americans, black and Latino Americans specifically. And black Americans have the least amount of wealth lower than Latino Americans, okay? So when we look at this, I've had people say, is there a zero missing there? Like, is that, are those real numbers? No, these are real yeah. numbers. Mm -hmm. That is a structural issue that cannot be ignored. And yet we continue to do it in the media. We continue to do it in the narratives that we produce. So the media has to get better at explaining and unpacking these narratives for us to go forward. We're running out of time, but Joseph... Uh, no, I mean, I think it's true. I mean, I think Dr. King said it best. You know, all we ask of America is to be true to what you say on paper. And so I think it's very difficult for people to understand that, yes, we might have things in pay on paper that make things equal. But at the same time, we have to have a commitment to making sure that we are actually living out what we actually say on paper and actually demanded of society. All right. Well, listen, I want to thank all three of you for joining us on the program. This has been a really uh, thoughtful and thorough conversation. I think we should be having more of them, and I'd love to have you all back. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. If you'd like to join the conversation, visit us at metrofocus.org. And for those of you watching at home today, Martin Luther King Day is about more than just a day off from work. It's a time of reflection. So head on over to our Facebook page and let us know what it means to you.